through and um, discuss what the issues were um, on the site, etc. And then an afternoon session where the team would sit down um, and iterate design. And then a follow up in the afternoon where everyone was invited back to see what the results of that day were. And it was a very inclusive process. So on a fast track, um, in, in a fast track condition, the ability to include the municipality, planning department, engineering, um, students, faculty, er and um, all of the stakeholders in an inclusive process where they could be part of it, engage, ask questions, and see how it was unfolding and what the critical issues were was imperative. Day two was really a focus on the building and um, how that unfolded, same type of process. And day three um, was really about putting together a public presentation in the morning, which was to represent everything that had happened over the past two days, and then have a public open house. And this was open to everybody who saw it in the paper, was invited um, intentionally, um, public open house for everybody in the community. And we had a number of attendees, we had the press, everything else, and it was televised as well. Um, so it was very public, very inclusive, and uh, exposed as far as the process went. So the results of that um, process, you can see on the right the site plan. That site plan sketch was developed on the third day of the charrette, and it was in our schematic design report, and it was in our design development report because of the legs that it had, and its currency to how the design developed. We're not suggesting you design in three days, but we're saying that the strength of the process uh, proved out in this case because it, it really did, and you'll see that the site plans we go through hasn't really altered from that original plan. To give a bit of a brief orientation on the building, the detail will come um, through the, the presentation, but um, this building is oriented north-south, and to some that may appear odd, if, if you're taking you know, your first approach at um, sustainable building design, you really want to look at an east-west orientation to really maximize your ability to um, capture the sun, etc. We had several site constraints um, that you can see on this image. It's actually right on the flight path to the local airport. So there's a navigation beacon adjacent to the site. Uh, there are two existing buildings on the campus. And um, so we had height restrictions, we had physical space restrictions, etc. So the resultant plan you see is a north-south orientation. Um, with wings that, that stretch out east-west. So the wings allow us the ability to take advantage of the natural conditions of the site um, and then address the, the issues with north-south. Fundamentally, the building serves a number of purposes on the campus. There's um, a, a, a student face to the building, and there's also a public community face. So there's no front and back. Um, so on the south end, that's really the student um, entrance to the campus, and on the north end, is the community fix. The gymnasium will be part of um, the community integration project and um, et cetera, so with the program. Um, just to touch on the program spaces then, because it is a trades facility, the main program is the trade shops. And another reason why we're not um, multi-level, it is a two-story to three-story building. We have access to the roof um, for educational purposes and et cetera. Um, but it is a long drawn up plan and you may you know, we've always talked about condensing our footprint and maybe going up is better, etc. But in this case, a number of reasons drove us to this, not the least of which was the living building challenge. So for uh, aspects that Robert will get into, um, it's very prudent for a single load um, and a long drawn out uh, organization. Plus we're not going to stack the types of spaces that we have in this program necessarily. So you see on the right side of the central spine are really the shop areas. And on the, the bottom right on the south is the um, demonstration workshop. So that's part of the, the educational component. It's a very public space. It's just shared space where you can uh, host events and also show aspects of what are happening within the school. Um, and then the student gathering space is also on the end, as we mentioned. And then on the left side of the spine, as you come up, are the faculty and student um, classroom spaces, etc. And they're designed to be interchangeable, as we'll get into. And then on the top is the gymnasium and the kinetics area. The second floor program is really similar to the main floor program. Um, so you can see the student face of the building, this entry, and um, one of the fundamental moves on the site is we obviously removed the parking lot from the heart of the campus um, and put it to the side and downplayed its um, significance and gave the heart of the campus back to the students and faculty and the public and created a, a court that the building helps frame on the campus. Some examples of the student space interconnected daylight demonstration workshop. 
the central spine, and it serves many purposes. It's not just a circulation corridor, it's a, a mechanism for boral light and also for student study space, etc. Trade workshops, classroom space, and that's interchangeable with the faculty offices. Part of the living building challenge um, requires a mental shift in how we live and work within buildings, and this was one that we had to tackle. The faculty are uh, all currently in single cellular offices. Um, with individual zone control, etc. So one of the things that we did tackle up front in the charrette was the concept of an open office, not necessarily 40 people, or etc. to a floor. Uh, these are six, uh, and they're the same size as a classroom module, which gives us flexibility in the building design. The gymnasium. And then another interesting aspect of this um, project is that there's a private group um, that's an incubator for sustainable startup businesses and technical businesses that are a tenant in the building and have been part of it from day one, we're part of the charrette process and are now inhabiting the space. And then this is our public um, community face of the building. And with that, I'll pass it to Rob. So um, Gary and myself, we're just going to go through the, the six petals and the six cherry pick a few examples of how this building is, is meeting the requirements of the living building challenge. So with just starting with the site, just to give you a bit of context, the site is, is in Penticton, which sits in the Oak Valley Valley. Very similar sort of climate conditions to here in Saskatoon. You have a little bit more sunlight than we do, and a little bit colder in the winter, or a lot more colder in the winter. <laughs> um, on the valley, in the valley between these two lakes, the ground conditions are very poor, um, which, which gave us some problems. And then this is just the site plan. You see the, the radio mast next to our site with the two buildings. Um, I'm going to jump into, into water. Um, so this, this challenge of net zero water is always going to be a, a difficult one. To treat our own water on site um, is always a very expensive solution and would challenge a budget from the outset. Um, but living building challenge is also about a, a building responding to the site that it's on. Uh, and very fortunately for, for us in the scheme, uh, in particular, have just installed, what we're, we're installing a state-of-the-art uh, water treatment facility across, uh, literally across the road from our site. It was going to be chemical free. Um, so through approaching the living building challenge, we agreed, they agreed that we could scale jump and allow us to basically we export our, our black water to the treatment facility and then bring back the same volume of water. We measure the volume that's going out and bring that same volume back. So we can use that treated effluent water as grey water within the building for flushing your animals and, and, and WCs, etc. Um, so thereby, we, 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 there was a big boost uh, in terms of our building. Uh, one other aspect on the, on the roof, uh, in talking about water, we, we have some areas of green roof. You know, green roof typically have very shallow soils um, because you can't keep the weight down. Um, and, and also they're trying to dry out because they're up on the roof and uh, they get the full sun. So what we, what we did is, is to drain the other areas of roof which have PV and other surfaces of the roof, we drain the water from those onto these green roofs. Penticton has very low rainfall, um, so by doing so during the summer months we can uh, triple or quadruple the amount of water going onto the green roofs. Um, but also those thin dry soils um, are almost identical to the conditions that are on the hillsides around uh, Penticton. You know, so we went for, for native planting, um, which is suited to thin dry soils on the hillsides, so, so thereby increasing the biodiversity on the site. One other aspect of, of, of the water cycle is the, the car parking. All the water in the car parking went down through bioswales to, to naturally take out the hydrocarbons that are in that water and, and filter it before returning it to ground to charge the, or recharge the groundwater. Um, and then we're looking to the, the indoor quality. Um, and we jump back to the site plan that Tim mentioned. That, you know, the first look at that is it, it's not what you'd expect. But it's been driven a lot by this 30-foot rule where all the spaces need to have access to daylight and natural ventilation. So looking at the, the ventilation, uh, so daylighting first of all, the, the, all the projections uh, on the um, academic side, the classrooms, have windows typically on the north and the south uh, being the most suited to, to be able to control the sunlight coming into a south elevation. Windows on the east 
very small punch windows on the east just to boost those areas that need a little bit of extra extra sunlight. And that's just an example of modeling the space. So very tried and tested technology I'm sure you're all familiar with in terms of sun shades, shading out the worst of the, the summer sun, using a light shelf to, to bank some of that light in off the light shelf and reflect off the ceiling and throw it deeper into that space. We have to, we have to maintain a, a certain light level throughout the building. And then the same same breeze lay in the winter, allowing that winter sun to come into the building to try and get that free heat to... Uh